I hit on this. There you go. So you can hit it on your side now and start. That's fine. Okay. Okay. One, two, three, go. Good day, everyone. This is Madhushri Gupta, and you are listening to the first episode of Conspiracy Minds, the show that, as you probably would have guessed, explores different conspiracy theories with each new episode for people that love to take a look at the other side and understand different conspiracy theories. Today, we're talking about Flat Earth with Mark Sargent, who is a leading proponent of the Flat Earth theory in the United States. He is the author of the book Flat Earth Clues, The Sky's the Limit, which was published in 2016 and is also a major speaker at Flat Earth conferences and events. Hello, Mr. Sargent, and thank you for joining us today. Hello, and thank you, by the way, for being the most polite and formal introducer of me ever. <laughs> That's awesome. You're welcome. And by, by the way, what, uh, what, what, where are you? What school is this? Oh, this is Black Hawk Middle School in Egan, Minnesota. Wow, Minnesota. I know, yeah. I know that area. That's, that's great. Weren't you here a couple months ago? Was I here? No, no. We did we did some meetups there in Minnesota, but uh, no, I, I I had a lot of friends from there, and so um, I've I've been. My family originally is from that area, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, a uh, little little town called Cochrane, Wisconsin. So that's awesome. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So what what? But but before we get started, I know you have a script, but I'll I'll kind of go off road a little bit. What's uh? How how'd you find me of all people? Um, so we, in, in our global studies class, we were watching the documentary called Behind the Curve. Yep. And, um, so we watched the entire documentary and during the same time in our communications class, we were supposed to make a podcast and then I couldn't really think of any ideas. So I thought, okay, why not? Let's interview him. Oh, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I, I hopefully I can I will um I will satisfy what you need out of this. So hit hit me with whatever you got. Ask me anything. Okay, so I would like to start by sharing a quote. A thing is not necessarily true because a man dies for it. What are your thoughts on this quote? Wow. That's good. I like that. I like that quote. Uh, and yes, tr truth and belief are very, very different. As you as you well know, uh, there are lots of beliefs out there which can't be absolutely proven, which people are willing to lay their lives down for. Uh, mm -hmm. Most notably, all the major religions. Right. It's, it's one of the running jokes with which is my my peace loving God is better than your peace loving God. And I'll kill anyone that says otherwise. Right. Yes. And like, okay. Uh, I mean, but no, no, I, I totally get that. Um, conviction, conviction rides the line between the two things, between an objective truth and blind faith. Or I'll give you one more quote because I love quotes. Thank you for, by the way, for using quotes. Um, there's a, there's an old quote, which says that science is stagnant, but religion is blind. Meaning science, you know, does all these, does all these things, you know, they, they try to lay everything in concrete, but they can't make the leaps of faith because they're incapable of doing it because science isn't faith and faith quite often will blindly jump into something without trying to back it up with extensive scientific research. So right. yeah, it's a good, it's a good quote. I like the quote. Um, so the main, the main topic of this podcast is flat earth mm -hmm. as i have uh, like i previously mentioned mm -hmm. um my first question is why do you believe the earth is flat why do i believe do, do you want like the physical reasons like why what finally convinced me that sort of thing or how i got started um what the reasons that convinced you okay um and and that's good because the uh, the documentary behind the curve covered pretty well how I got into it back in the day. But the five big reasons which they wouldn't talk about in the documentary, because they did not want that that film to uh, cover the nuts and bolts on on Netflix, definitely not, was um, the five. I'll give you the five big reasons that were th that I threw at a, a Georgetown physicist 
some mm -hmm. years ago, which was first one would be long distance photography. That's the, that's the biggest one. And that's not even, it didn't have anything to do with my clues at all, which is you, if the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared or eight inches per mile per mile, eventually a boat should go over the horizon and you should never see it again because it's going over the side of a hill, right? Well, that's not the case anymore. What's really changed is long distance photography, most notably HD technology, which even outdates you. I mean, you're, you're pretty young. We came up with HD technology uh, 20, 20 years ago, give or take. And what, what that means is you can go out to a beach and you see a boat go over the horizon, it's gone. And now you can take out an HD camera, pretty cheap one actually, crank up the zoom on it, and that boat comes back into frame crystal clear depending on the weather conditions. That's that's the number one thing. That's what most get most people into flat earth. Um, not me, though. The, the second one was the big one for me, which was gravity versus uh, the vacuum of space, which is uh, when you let's say you're whatever room you're in. If you know anything about vacuum chambers, I highly recommend anyone go online and, and look up anything in a vacuum chamber. Right. A vacuum chamber means there's nothing there. There's no air. There's no molecules. There's nothing in it. But since nothing is invisible, it kind of tricks our eyes because you could look at, at somebody in a room next to you and it'd be like, oh, that's, that could be a vacuum chamber. You don't know because it's invisible. Right. But what I'm getting at is if there's a vacuum chamber above you and you had a valve and you cracked that valve, the air from your room would rush up instantaneously. It's not slow like the movies. Uh, one of my Mark Twain quotes, and I'll throw quotes at you, is um, Mark Twain said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, which means that Hollywood tends to embellish things and ignore science just be, for the for the sake of the story it looks more dramatic on camera so if there's a hole in the side of the spaceship it's like oh we only have two minutes of air left get the duct tape right that's not how it is uh if it's a real vacuum chamber it's instantaneous everybody's dead um the end of, of sp any any space movie where they open up a door to the vacuum of space everyone's dead in a fraction of a second it's that fast right. so so the question is if your air rushes up that fast right and you go outside and you remember outside, we have our atmosphere, which you're breathing in right now, but then there's the vacuum of space bordering it. Why is our atmosphere still here? Why hasn't the massive vacuum space, you know, the vacuum of space, why isn't it just ripped off our, our atmosphere and, and torn it to shreds? And your only response, the only response you can give is, well, it's gravity. Gravity is obviously holding the air down. I go, you mean the same gravity that couldn't keep the air in your room from going upstairs that gravity and that, but there's an atmosphere that covers the earth and there's many layers to that atmosphere and so what? that layer of gases is what is around earth that that is true that is true if if you, if you believe the global system however when you get to the edge of space right where the edge where our atmosphere ends and space begins and no scientist has ever been able to, to answer this what happens there? What happens when, and, and I know you're not in, in a lot into physics right now, you're too young, but look up something called, uh, and I can't remember the thermodynamic rule, but it says what number it is, but it is space, a pressure cannot exist next to no pressure, meaning a vacuum, without a physical barrier. It is a law of thermodynamics. It is not a, a guideline. It is not a rule. It is a law, meaning it cannot be broken. Right. If you blow up a balloon with your mouth, right, and you have that balloon sitting there and you let go of it a million times out of a million times, it'll just fly around the room because the pressure has to equalize. And no scientist has ever come back to me and said uh, what happens where our space, you know, where our atmosphere ends and space begins because it can't happen. It, it completely breaks the law of thermodynamics. But no, again, the physics clubs in schools, and you'll learn this when you go to high school and university, are very, very small compared to the general population. General population, super dumb really 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 dumb i mean they're lucky they can drive by the by the time they get 20 to 21 anyway number three out of five uh these these last year quick which is the uh the moon eclipse shadow is too small so if the moon mainstream science is the moon is 2000 miles wide right you know the, the earth supposedly is 8000 miles wide the moon is 2000 miles wide very very small but the eclipse shadow, when, when there's eclipse, you know, the blackout zone, and that's, there's another one coming up here pretty soon, I think, in the States, is only 70 miles wide. Okay, what, what happened? Why did the shadow condense down to 70 miles wide? Why is it so tiny? And you can talk about 
physics and condensing things like a magnifying lens all you want. The problem is, is that we say the moon is only about 70 miles wide. Remember, when you walk on a sunny day next to a wall, your shadow is either life size or larger. It never gets smaller, right? You, so you're walking next to a building. Your shadow never shrinks down to the size of an action figure. And that's what the... So the length of shadow can vary throughout the times of day, right? Yes. Depending on the position of the sun. Yes, you're absolutely right. Quoting, quoting from the book perfectly. However, the shadow can never get smaller. It can only, it can, it can vary in size, right? It can be, it can be your size, can be life size, what you are, and it can stretch to be much, much longer, but it can never get smaller. We can never make it smaller. And that's what the eclipse shadow does. Anyway, moving on. Number hold four. Up, hold up. Hold up. We were, we were talking about the moon, right? Yes. Then how did shadows get into this? Oh, oh, sorry. You haven't been in an eclipse yet. So um, when you are, the, so in the movie, there was a scene there where I was actually watching an eclipse. Yes. Right, up, up, in, up in the sky. That viewing zone, the area where you can view a, a, the eclipse. A lot of people don't know this. In where, where the sun is completely covered by the moon is only 70 miles wide at its widest point. Meaning, you know, if you're if you're like two miles down the road from, from outside this big black circle, you will not see a total eclipse. And it's only 70 miles wide. Right. It's very, very small. Very small. Compare again. Remember, the moon is 2000 miles wide. So why is this blackout zone so small? That's because, well, people would counter your thoughts with saying that the moon is like. It's we can't see its actual, you know, um, diameter nor the sun's. So I mean, those let's say the the moon and the sun are like very far away from the earth, and the sun is even farther away. Yeah. So how how are people on earth going to see their actual true size? I got you. I got you. Okay, to that to that argument, I would counter with this, and we shouldn't dwell on this one too much because this one kind of bends people's heads, which is. When the moon goes, so so the solar eclipse is when the moon gets in front of the sun, right? A lunar eclipse is when the, the earth gets in front of the sun and then it casts a shadow on the moon. Well, if the earth, remember, using that same logic, right? If the 2,000 mile wide sun condensed down to 70 miles wide, then an 8,000 mile earth should go only down to, let's say, 250 miles, 280 miles at the most, right? On the on the moon, but that's not the case. the The moon, you know, it should be the moon should turn into a big eyeball with a big black circle in the center, and it doesn't. Uh, we, you know, in fact, it's this fuzz, you know, it's this dark kind of mass, you know, spherical thing that covers the entire moon. But anyway, it's just for reference. Think about it as we as we go on. Uh, number four, the moon temperature, fantastic one. I didn't even come up with this. This was brilliant which was somebody called me up on a, on a radio show. And they say, hey, by the way, the, um, the moon is generating a cold light. It's colder in the moonlight. I'm just going, okay, it's colder at night. We all get that. It's like, no, 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 no. It's worse than that. Meaning when you're standing in the sun, right? You know, when you get, so like say it's 80 degrees in the sun, it's 70 degrees in the shade, right? We all know this, you know, whatever light is being blocked by what you're standing behind a building, it's going to be cooler in the shade. But if yeah. you're in the moonlight, right? Full, full moonlight, it's the exact opposite. Meaning the moon, it could be, you could be standing in the moonlight, it might be 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the moonlight, yeah. but it's up to 60 degrees and more in the moon shade. It's warmer in the shade of the moon. And you're probably saying, is that, how does that even work? It's like, and you can test this with infrared temperature guns all day long. And we've done all sorts of fun tests, including um, full-blown thermal vision. And it's absolutely true. So, and what it means is the um, the the moon is is self illuminated. It's not reflecting anything from the sun. It's generating its own cold laser light. And cold laser light is something we've been able to do in universities. Well, heck, even health and beauty products for years, decades. You can go on Amazon, type in you know cold laser light, and it'll pop up all sorts of beauty products. So the question is why why is the moon doing this? Now, does this prove that the Earth is flat? The the moon temperature? No. No, not at all, but it completely wipes out the relationship between the sun and the moon. Because remember, the moon's supposed to be reflecting the sun's light. At the very least, it should be neutral. It should never be colder in the moonlight, but it is. And again, you can test this very, very cheaply. Last but not least, number five, 
would be the Van Allen belts. Do you ever heard about the Van Allen belts? You know what those are? No. Okay. Van Allen radiation belts, um, named after a professor who worked for NASA, named Van Allen, of all people. He said that the, uh, the entire world is surrounded by this big giant donut of radiation super super thick and super deadly and in the 50s he said no one ever should go up there ever 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 people will just die if they go up there well and then in 1960 the americans is like oh yeah we should start our own space program okay and they asked van allen and they said oh how are you going to get past the van allen belts which you said we couldn't get past and he said well we're we're just going to go really really fast it's like okay but you said they're like 50 60 000 miles thick and our best speed is not even twenty thousand miles an hour which means you're going to be spending hours in them each way and don't forget there's only three things that can stop radiation right that we know of um lead which is you know a very dense metal uh, gold which is actually believe it or not twice as dense as lead and but it's so expensive nobody has a you know chunk of gold that 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 heavy and uh, water, which they use for uh, atomic power plants. They use tons and tons of water to, as a barrier, and it works very, very, very well. But you can't use any of these in aerodynamics because uh, it completely screws up rockets and planes and everything. You don't put an anchor on the top of a rocket or in the front of a plane. You just don't. So in, so with the, the American space program, we just used aluminum and plastic as our shielding okay um and and you know we made mount round trips no astronauts died nobody got radiation poisoning nobody even got cancer there's still four of these guys from the apollo program i think still walking around so the the question is are the van allen belts deadly yes or no well again if you say uh yes they're deadly then again how the americans make all those round trips and nobody died and if they're not deadly, and we'll find you can go to the NASA site where they say the Orion program that they're working on. And of course, Artemis is, is working on this as well. Uh, they, they didn't know how to solve the radiation problem. So they're not going to use manned capsules until they, they can solve it. It's like you, you solved it in the 1960s. What happened? What happened there? Anyway, so between those five questions, right? Real easy that I, that I threw out at this, this physicist in, out of Georgetown. That was it. He folded. He, he was like, nope, we're not doing this. Uh, and to be fair, uh, you know, no scientist is going to take on those five questions because they're too varied. When you reach a PhD level in something, your focus is very, very narrow, meaning you have a, um, you have a very narrow range of topics you're comfortable talking about and anything outside of that, you just don't feel qualified. So you don't, cause you don't want to be misquoted or, or give the wrong answer or whatever it is. So yeah, those are the, the big five reasons. Sorry. I know it took a while to get to that. I'm sorry. It's uh, like our t- like our time mark, we are about to pass that. So I'm going to have to go through evidences of around Earth really quick right now. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So number one is Foucault's pendulum. Yeah. This Foucault's pendulum swings in a fixed plane. And that fixed plane is ceiling. The direction of the travel changes throughout the day because of the Earth moving beneath it. Okay. And then uh, the Coriolis effect, the... The objects in the northern hemisphere um, are deflected to the right because of the Coriolis effect. Right. And objects in the southern hemisphere are deflected to the left. If the Earth was flat, then why would the Coriolis effect happen? Okay. Third is mirage or mirage. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce Mira- it. Mirage. You were, you were okay. close. Mirage. 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 Um, the, so in your documentary... Uh, at the beginning, I heard that you said you can see Seattle from the shore, and this is like the evidence of a flat Earth. However, yeah. a mirage is um, the light rays re- refract towards the colder or denser air, which in this case is the other side of the sea or ocean, whatever. Okay. And in real life, the skyline is below the horizon. Therefore, you are only seeing you are only seeing the mirage of the buildings of Seattle, even though they aren't actually there. And yep. um, also one more thing that you, you should think about is that ships emerge from the waves. They don't simply like appear out of the horizon. If the earth was flat, they would appear out of the horizon. But with our own eyes, we can see that ships, they emerge from the wave, waves. And then the farther you climb a tree, the farther the line of vision extends to the horizon and it's not the same as the base of a tree let's say if the earth was flat you you're standing at the base of a tree and then 
even if you climb to the top, you can see the exact same thing that you saw when you were at the bottom. And also one more thing is that the center of mass is the center of the sphere in the spherical earth. Um, the gravity of earth is equally distributed, but otherwise on a flat plane, the center of the mass is the center of the plane. And therefore the gravitational force can pull everything towards the middle of the plane. And gotcha. why is that happening? Gotcha. Okay. And and I know we don't have time to answer those. Uh, it's, but, and I love, uh, thank you, by the way, for those talking points. Those are wonderful textbook talking points. And I've heard them several times over the years. I will address the last one just briefly, because I, I, I know for your assignment, we don't have a lot of time, which is do not forget that gravity, and, and again, every scientist will tell you this, is still only just a theory. Every scientist will say they can tell you what gravity does, but they can't tell you why it does it. So as far as pulling things down to the center of a mass, again, it is it is only a theory right now. They can there's a lot of things that science that you know repeatable experiments, sure, but can they tell you why it happens? No, not in that case. So, but no, I I love your I love your your talking points. Good stuff. You did your research. Um and like one more thing that I would like to cover is that even in the uh behind the curve documentary, yeah. a bunch of flat earthers did experiments to prove that the earth was flat. However, they failed. Like um, there was an experiment involving a laser gyroscope. Yep. And as the earth rotates, the gyroscope appears to lean off axis, yep. staying in its original position as the earth's curvature changes in relation. Right. And even like, they were trying to prove that the earth was flat however with like a really expensive gyroscope it still it still um turned out that the earth was a sphere gotcha Move. my rebuttal to that would be two things one do not forget that we didn't make that movie that was the hollywood team and they hated us a, a lot and the, there is something which you will learn later which is called the power of editing uh, when it came to the ring laser gyroscope, uh, the only thing I can tell you there is, does it record a 15 degree per hour shift in the sky? Yes. So the argument is, what's moving? Is the ground moving or is the sky moving? It, we, you know, we say that the uh, the sky is moving. They say that the ground is moving, that, you know, that the earth is moving. Uh, and, and, you know, the argument, you know, continues from there. However, the laser at the end, I have to clarify this, which was, and that was a screw up on, on Jaron's part, which was they did not have line of sight. There was no dry runs. They went out there because Google Earth said the area was flat and it actually wasn't flat. And nobody verified this, including the, uh, the film team. And so that's how they edited it. They was like, oh no, we, there were tons of other experiments, so many other experiments that the film team would not let us use because sort of like National Geographic, the, you know, that film team, they don't want us to show successful experiments at all. So they chop up whatever they can and make us look as bad as possible. So again, appreciate that you watched it and paid attention, but those two experiments were just two of many uh, and it was edited for, you know, or I should say edited against us. Then why? So you're saying that this, uh, behind the curve documentary was, was made by national geograph geographic. No, 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 no. It was, it was made by a Hollywood film team that had nothing to do with us. It was a, oh. it was a hit piece, uh, meaning it was just a side project for a, a small independent Hollywood team. We had literally had nothing to do with it. Uh, the produce, you know, the main producers, the director, the editors, all very, very against Flat Earth. And they thought it was just going to be a fun human interest piece. But by the time they got to the end, they realized that this, you know, this was way bigger than they thought and they couldn't give it any credibility. And to, you know, for these guys, I will give them give them credit, which is they were asked in just about every film festival that they went to. The first question that was ever asked the director and the producers is like, are you guys Flat Earthers? And they said, no, absolutely not. And it was probably good that they said that because had they said, no, we're flat earthers, then the, the audience would have probably turned against them. So no, 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 no. It was, there was, a, there was, I'll, I'll give you one more. Here's a quick little example. Again, I know we're out of time, but you know, I'll talk 
if you want to chop this up later for for time's sake that's fine but you remember the scene in the movie where i didn't hit the green button did you remember that part the green button where uh, when i was at the the kennedy space center and i was sitting down and i was playing with the monitor up above and then i left and they were showing the green button because i couldn't get anything to work and they were showing the green button like i'd never hit it yeah i don't remember that that's all right I, I'll, I'll explain it to you really quick sit down and there's literally only one button next to the chair it's a giant it was meant for children right and i beat on that thing for at least 30 seconds and it's like well maybe i can override it with a touch screen but of course it wasn't a touch screen but what they did was they figured out hey you know if we leave the part out where mark isn't hitting the green button and then we show the green button later it'll make mark look like oh he missed the most obvious thing there in fact they even asked me during you know after the movie was made can we leave that in there for for comedy effect i said sure why not? It's a good, it's a good little joke. I mean, you know full well what happened, but that's fine. You can leave it in there. And uh, again, that's the power of editing. You can do lots of things to to make us you know, look a certain if, way. If this is the problem with like people who are against flat Earth making documentaries with flat Earth supporters, then why don't you just make your own documentary with like you know um, successful experiments? We have. We, we've made tons and tons of content. The problem is, is that you have, you can make, a lot of people don't know this. There are 99% of the movies that are made and documentaries and everything will never see the light of day. You can shoot, you can spend a million dollars and make your own movie, but who's going to distribute it? What network is going to put up, you know, put it on their thing. So when this team made the movie, they had no faith in it at all that it was going to get anything. So eventually, yes, Netflix bought it and Amazon bought it and iTunes bought it. But until somebody buys it, it goes nowhere. So we've made, oh, I can't tell you the thousands of hours of stuff we've made. But no one's going to buy it because it looks like a propaganda movie. The only reason the, the movie you saw made it to Netflix is because it showed both sides. Well, the, here's the flatter side. Oh, here's an astronaut. Here's a scientist. Here's a psychologist. But but in the end, it was never going to be in Flat Earth's favor. So, yeah, no, we, we tried many, many times. In fact, there's a documentary which uh, I helped finish, which is going to premiere uh, at the end of June, I believe. Out to, and I, I almost guarantee it's not going to get picked up by anybody because there's, you know, it's they don't want this sort of, you know, science is a well-established institution. They don't want to mess with it. Okay. Sorry, I know I'm hitting you with a lot of stuff here, but it, it's fine. It's completely fine. <laughs> I mean, this is what it's for. No, well, yeah. I, again, we all we're doing, and we're not trying to ram this down anybody's throats or anything. We're just trying. You know, we're putting the idea out there. It's like, look, there was. If you go into Google and type in ancient cosmology, you will see every. You know, click on images, you'll see that every culture everywhere drew the same thing. They all drew a snow globe you know, a, a big domed structure, because that's what they viewed. It was only later when NASA came out, the Americans, and said, oh, no, 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 it's a globe. We have pictures. The question is, if you found out for sure that, that you know, after you were telling people it was a globe for 500 years, even though you didn't have a space program until 1960, and you found out, oh, indeed, it wasn't a globe, it actually was a snow globe type thing, a domed structure, would you tell the people? Would you tell everybody? Now, honest journalism would be like, oh, the people have a right to know. But really, would you? And you remember, 1960, everything was pretty much built. All the infrastructure is done. All this civilization has already been established. You really want to mess with that? I know. I wouldn't. Not then. Maybe now. Um, the part that you spoke about ancient cultures and the snow globe model thingy, yeah. um, there, like, even in ancient times, there were many cultures that that portrayed the earth as a globe. Ooh, you're going to have to back that up with something. Seriously. I have to back that up. You, re um, you really got to type in. Seriously, go into Google. Not in a second. In ancient, but In ancient India, uh, in, South, in South Asia mainly, the earth was a sphere. Okay. It, it is a sphere. And um, there are stories of, of, of God incarnating and then you know, uh, putting the earth on his, um, like, what's it called? Like, you know, the things boars have the like, tusks? Trunk, yeah, tusks of the wild boar. So yeah. God incarnated as a wild boar and, 
um, saved the earth. And in that story, the earth is portrayed as a globe. And mind you, this story is thousands of years old. I would look if, again, and I, I know you're Indian. I would look even deeper into Indian culture. Do you have you ever heard of the Mahabharata? Yes. I would look into that a little bit because you remember you, according to you guys, and I believe every you know everything on the Mahabharata. You know where um, uh, you guys, the the ancient Indian civilizations were high tech and they created floating cities and they went to war and basically blew each other up. You know the the one of the the early uh, atomic powers from back in the day. So you know. Again, if when we're done with this, please do send me um some uh some some pics of uh, early representation of Indian culture. I'd love to see it. Of course, sure. Love to love to see it. But for the most part, what I'm saying is again, type in ancient cosmology and then click on images. Ninety something percent will be some sort of dome structure. Now, if the Indians are the exception, hey, great, wonderful. I mean, I know the Greeks are kind of in there, too, but just about everybody else. Of course, why wouldn't you say it was a dome structure back in the old days? Because, you know, the, st the stars and everything in the sky took sort of this curved arc, you know, way yeah, above. But they couldn't really see beyond that because they, they they didn't have spaceships to go in, into outer space. The, the good, excellent point. The question is, when you finally get spaceships, again, remember, we did not, NASA wasn't even founded until 1958. So 1959, 58, 58, right? Yeah, 58. So no, I think it was 59. Damn it. Anyway, so <laughs> it's the details. But if if we didn't even have the first space programs until then, again, and if you found out when you finally went up there and you're like, oh man, it's a it's it's an old cartoon joke from back in the day. Do you tell the people if you find out, or do you just kind of carry the narrative? Uh, governments keep secrets, always have, always will. Uh, there's an old, old presidential saying from the United States, which which is only give people as much truth as they can handle. You know what I mean? It's or or, so, you know, the, another saying would be some things are better left unsaid if it, if it messes with everybody. It's like, yeah, you know, the, the population's a pretty nervous, twitchy bunch. Not you. You seem pretty well adjusted. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Anything else I can I can answer for you? Um, my final question is, like, what are your what are your beliefs in science? Like the scientific community, do you believe in science overall? Yes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, a lot of flat earthers. Remember, most of the people who get into flat Earth hate flat Earth. Uh, we we know we had to relearn so many scientific facts and factoids that you know we can go on the street and we can out science all sorts of people on a regular basis however that being said science tends to science has morphed into something that we call scientism which is they kind of created their own religion which is the i'll use a neil degrasse tyson quote if you know who he is which is um science is right whether or not you believe in it and that's very that's a very dangerous saying, which is if, we, if if our lab coat people say that it's a thing, then it's a thing. However, science is wrong about stuff and they get stuff wrong all the time. They just never apologize for it. You know what I mean? So if you want to tell me again, for, for me, science is because it's a personal question. You want to tell me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level? Yeah, sure. Great. I can grab a, a pot and put it on the stove and get a thermometer. And I can test it myself. You want to tell me what the core of the earth looks like, though? no you can't do that because the deepest hole ever drilled by science is less than eight miles so if it if the deepest hole is only less than eight miles and it's supposedly four thousand miles down to the center why are you showing me a perfect thousand mile layer cross section of the earth all the way to the core and then not only that the the, the audacity to say oh yeah by the way here's what the cross section of mars looks like and jupiter and saturn and, and you go into Wikipedia and you you look at the fine print and, and it says, oh, yeah, we have no idea what's down there. We're just taking a guess. And it's like, well, you might want to put that somewhere. And, you know, science wants to be as credible as possible. So they don't make guesses. They, they say, no, this is what it is until it's not. And then then they have to redo it. Look up something. If you ever get a chance, look up something called the uh, the coelacanth fish. Love it. C O E L. A-C-A-N-T-H, really ugly prehistoric fish, right? 
It's one of my favorites, which is it is absolutely, you know, they, they found fossil records. It's been extinct for at least 70 million years. Right. Every scientist, every scientist in the world would have bet the farm that this thing was extinct for 70 million years because we got the fossils that, that yeah. show it. And then one was found off of South South Africa by the British military in 1940. And then another one off of Madagascar, another one off of Mozambique. And the next thing you know, the scientists has come back. Oh, wow. It seems like they're swimming all around Africa. And National Geographic goes down there and they, you know, with scuba divers and they start filming it. Question is, why did they get it so wrong? <laughs> why were they absolutely put in a certificate you can frame wrong? And that's because they, uh, you know, they made a, a massive assumption, which is okay. The, the carbon dating system is this way. The fossil system is this way. Everything lines up, so this fish must fit into that. And when they were finally challenged, it's like, oh no, here I caught one in my net the other day. Then they have to come back and say, well, it's a living fossil and uh, evolution wise, it's in a it's in stasis. It hasn't evolved. It looks the exact same as it did from the fossils. So and you, that just happens over and over and over again with science. My only complaint with science is that they don't apologize when they get things wrong. They just put it under the banner of science, sort of like I'll throw one more out at you, which is the, uh, the double slit experiment. You ever heard of that? No. Perfect. Look up, look up the double slit experiment. Apparently it was a real coup in physics back in the day, which is basically, and it's video game technology that, that before video games were a thing, meaning when you're in a video game, you play video games at all? No, I don't. I don't. Play video games. All right. But you know what they are. So yeah. when you're looking at something in a video game, whatever's in front of you is being rendered perfectly as bet as good as it can but everything behind you in a video game is barely being rendered at all if it's even there at all it's just blobs it's it's low res and that's because you know you want to save processor power you know you don't want to, why why render stuff that you're not even looking at the problem is with the double sit experiment which they came up with years and years decades ago which it, way before computers is that that's happening where we are now meaning uh, when you're, if you're not observing something, you know, if you're not recording something at point blank range, if, if you're looking at it, it's absolutely being rendered perfectly. If you're not looking at it, it's not, it's barely being rendered at all. And it's, it's staggering. It's like, okay, why, why are, are we seeing something in our world that's be, that we're also seeing in the video game worlds, which we're creating and, and science and why you're saying, what's that got to do with anything? It's like, well, science says because it's repeatable and we can repeat it every time it's under the banner of science it's like yeah but you can't explain it you can't tell me tell me how it happens without using the word magic or virtual reality which they don't like talking about anyway other thing you know look up also uh neuroscience and free will that's also a fancy fascinating little little wiki entry you could you could jump into that science or the hundredth monkey effect look up that if you get a chance, you know how animals tend to update like software when it when it reaches a certain threshold, then all animals get updated simultaneously. We didn't come up with that. Science did, and they hate it. Science also finds things that they don't like, and so they kind of put it in a box and put it off in a closet somewhere. It's like, yeah, we don't want to talk about that. How how is that science though? Science science isn't man-made. Science has always existed in nature. So maybe it, it's like a particular organization that wants to hide something but how can you blame it on science no 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 and and you know what you you're right objectively science is all right so what were you saying oh we we're we we're talking about and you had a really good question there and I, I i think it's fair that it should be answered which is um yes science in itself the scientific method uh um uh test test and repeat you know, the whole, you know, create a theory, test it and the repeat and, and keep refining it. The, the, the scientific method, of course, is great. And everybody does it to some degree in, in real life. Um, however, you are correct that science, along with everything else, can be corrupted by people who have bad intentions. Uh, you know, the, one of the most famous, of course, would be atomic power or atomic energy or just, you know, splitting the atom. Which is, you know, once it's like, well, hey, it could be used for power. But what, what was the first thing we used it for? You know, weapons almost, almost immediately. Uh, science can be commandeered by, uh, you know, different groups very, very easily. So we're and we're not when we're, we're going after science, we're not attacking every scientist in a lab coat, anything by 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 that. Not, not even close where we kind of get 
our feathers ruffled is when science is used as a defense, just like a, a like a knee jerk response. You know, I, it's like people will come at it, it's like flat earth. It's like, hey, bro, do you even science? It's like, OK, you're just going to you know, people use that kind of like they throw out gravity as a, as a cure all to, to many, many things. So, no, I mean, I I specifically don't go after science. I you know, scientists are fine. You know, the, I've got no problem with scientists. They, they tend to be a little tunnel visioned. I'll go after NASA, you know, a space agency, which is not really a space agency. They're uh, they're part of the Department of Defense. They are a military organization, no different than the Army, Navy, and Air Force. You know, they were built on the still burning embers of the World War II uh, Nazi rocket program. So, yes, to your question, no. So I, I, I like science. Look, we're talking on the fruits of science right now. You know, the, the, the one part of future that we got, which was our communications networks. Those are really, really great. We didn't get flying cars like we were promised or robot servants or ray guns. Ray guns is probably a terrible idea anyway. Uh, but you know, the, do, do I love what science can do? Yes. I, I remember I was in the tech sector for years. I, I did tech support. I played computer games for a living, played video games for a living, which they I don't know if they even talked about in the documentary. Uh, I'm going to have to cut you off because the podcast was supposed to go for 10 minutes. I know. I know. Well, you can always make it a two-parter or for extra credit, make sure you give the whole audio thing to your teacher. I'm sure he or she will be thrilled. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, Okay, so today we spoke about the flat earth theory with Mark Sargent, who is a famous who is a famous flat earth proponent, and we spoke about flat earth beliefs and evidence of the flat earth. And thank you so much, Mark, Mr. Sargent, for joining us today, and for the audience for joining us today and learning more about the flat earth theory. Thank you, and have a great day. Check out the next episode on Friday and email or follow on social media and leave a comment about this big topic. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. What's your next one going to be, by the way? Okay. I just stopped the recording. Okay. Um, the next one, there isn't going to be a next one. It's just a one episode thing. Oh, you should, your your question's very good. You should do a next one. See if you can find somebody else on a different conspiracy thing. I think it'd be great. Yeah. Um. Anyways, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks. It was a pleasure. You had you had great questions and you, uh, you did your homework. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Uh, you too. Goodbye. Hello, Maggie.